Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Valerie Sanderson, and in the early hours of Monday, the 4th of December, these are our main stories. Israel says it's begun its ground offensive against Hamas targets in southern Gaza. We have the capabilities to do this in the most thorough way. And just as we did it strongly and thoroughly in the north, we're also going to do it now in the southern Gaza Strip. It comes as Houthi rebels in Yemen, who are backed by Iran, say they've attacked two ships in the Red Sea. This morning, the naval forces at the Yemeni armed forces carried out a targeted operation against two Israeli ships in the Bab al-Mandab Strait. The first ship was targeted with a naval missile and the second ship with a naval drone. There's criticism of the head of the UN Climate Summit in Dubai following revelations that he cast doubt on the world's ability to phase out fossil fuels without affecting living standards. Also in this podcast, a leading campaigner for democracy in Hong Kong, Agnes Chow, flees to Canada. And in Wales... A police officer who was walking past just happened to spot this thing in their garden and decided he didn't really like the look of it. An hour later, they were told the bomb squad would be there in the morning to get rid of it. Israel's attacks on the Gaza Strip have continued to intensify since the ceasefire broke down on Friday. Now Israel has confirmed that its ground troops have expanded their incursion into the south of the territory. The head of the military, Herzi Halevi, said they'd been there since Saturday and their operation would be no less powerful than the one carried out in northern Gaza. We have the capabilities to do this in the most thorough way. And just as we did it strongly and thoroughly in the northern Gaza Strip, we're also going to do it now in the southern Gaza Strip. And we continue to secure our accomplishments in the northern Gaza Strip. The UN refugee chief has warned that Israel's renewed campaign, which follows the breakdown of a week-long truce, is pushing the population in Gaza into an increasingly narrow corner of the territory. And the language from the aid agencies still working in southern Gaza is becoming increasingly desperate. James Elder is a spokesman for the UN Children's Agency, UNICEF, and is in the southern city of Han Yunus. Many are well aware they are moving to a place with no water, no shelter, no sanitation. In shelters here, it's about one toilet for 400 people. You go somewhere else and it's no toilets for 4,000 people. So as a doctor has said to me, we've had the attacks from the sky. The next phase of this will be death from disease. It's a cynical narrative, to be perfectly honest. Nowhere has been safe. And to send people into places where previously they've been bombed anyway and there are absolutely none of the essentials that they need is moving people on a chessboard. A senior advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister, Mark Regev, said the IDF was taking steps to avoid civilian casualties. We're making a maximum effort, maybe even unprecedented in, in similar circumstances. It's not the entire city of Kanyunis which is going to be uh, susceptible to combat operations. We've designated specific neighbourhoods and we've given advance warning to the people in those neighbourhoods, the civilians, to please leave. We've allocated special safer zones for them to go to. And the hope is that we won't see civilians caught up in the crossfire between the Israeli Defence Forces and the Hamas terrorists. I got the latest on military developments from our correspondent in Jerusalem, Paul Adams. General Herzi Halevi this evening has said that the IDF are conducting ground operations in the southern Gaza Strip and have been since yesterday morning. He said that Hamas commanders would meet the IDF everywhere in a very strong way. This comes after reports of tanks and troops being seen northeast of the city of Khan Yunis, suggesting that the Israelis are pushing in from the nearby Israeli border fence, perhaps in an effort to cut off another chunk of the Gaza Strip, just as they did in the north. This comes as UN officials are warning, aren't they, of the hardship already faced by many Gazans and the Americans too urging Israel to mitigate civilian casualties. What's Israel saying about that? Well, these warnings are coming thick and fast, but at the moment, all the indications are that Israel is determined 
to press ahead. You heard from Mark Regev there a suggestion that the Israelis believe that what they are offering to the citizens of the Gaza Strip is a more precise way of getting out of harm's way. But we spent the last couple of days trying to find out from Gazans what they think about these new maps that have been distributed throughout the Gaza Strip. And frankly, they seem confused. What they can tell from those maps is the areas that the Israelis are saying are not safe. But it is not clear to them which areas are safe. And because the Israeli armed forces reserve the right to hit high-value Hamas targets wherever they are in the Gaza Strip, then there is always the likelihood or the possibility that civilians will find themselves in areas outside these designated danger areas but nevertheless subject to airstrikes. And I think the aid agencies regard it as, frankly, inadequate. And you have to bear in mind that we're talking about the southern two-thirds of the Gaza Strip, which basically now include most of the civilian population. Paul Adams in Jerusalem. Meanwhile, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court says civilians in Gaza must be given access to food, water and medical supplies without delay. Karim Khan has visited Israel and the occupied West Bank at the request of relatives of Israeli victims of the Hamas attacks in October. A correspondent in The Hague, Anna Holligan, reports. Karim Khan visited two of the kibbutz targeted by Hamas and the site of the Nova Music Festival. He described scenes of calculated cruelty. Mr Khan said the killings and abductions represented some of the most serious international crimes and had shocked the conscience of humanity. He said hostages cannot be treated as human shields or bargaining chips and again called for their immediate release. The ICC prosecutor also emphasised a profound concern with what he described as a significant increase in attacks by Israeli settlers against Palestinian civilians in the West Bank and underlined that the International Court is continuing to investigate these incidents with focus and urgency. Anna Holligan. An American warship on patrol in the Red Sea has found itself caught up in the widening regional shockwaves of the conflict in Gaza. The Pentagon issued a statement saying the USS Kearney had shot down a drone that had been launched from an area of Yemen controlled by Houthi rebels. It added that there had been four attacks in the area against three commercial ships sailing in international waters and that it had no doubt Iran had enabled the attacks. For their part, the Houthis issued this statement. This morning, the naval forces of the Yemeni armed forces, with the help of God Almighty, carried out a targeted operation against two Israeli ships in the Bab al-Mandab Strait. The first ship was targeted with a naval missile and the second ship with a naval drone. The Yemeni armed forces continue to prevent Israeli ships from navigating the Red and Arab Seas until the Israeli aggression against our steadfast brothers in the Gaza Strip stops. Our Middle East analyst Sebastian Usher tell me more. As we just heard, the Houthis issued this statement and they named the ships. They said the Unity Explorer and Number 9. What we've heard since then is from the Israelis. The Israelis have said that they have no connection to Israel whatsoever. This is a pattern we've seen several times in the past few weeks. The Houthis have said that they are determined to attack any ships which have any relationship with Israel that are within their reach. The USS Kearney is there in the region to protect the shipping. It responded. The USS Kearney has already been involved several times in these past few weeks in those sorts of operations. So this seems like an incident which is in a continuum. Certainly the Houthis are trying to step it up, but at the moment I don't think they've crossed the threshold. Sebastian Usher. Ministers from more than 60 countries have been meeting at the COP28 climate summit in Dubai to discuss the health challenges posed by global warming. More than 120 countries have endorsed the annual conference's first ever health declaration, which acknowledges what can be done to reduce the impact of climate change on health. Our global health correspondent, Tulip Mazamda, is at the summit and sent us this report. One by one, health ministers from dozens of countries stood up and talked about the impact of climate change on their people and what they're doing to try and mitigate against it. Heat stress, air pollution and the spread of disease were all said to be made worse by our warming planet. Those who spoke most passionately were from countries that have contributed the least to climate change but are at the most risk. 
The first ever health declaration championed by countries including the UK recognises the need for stronger health systems and acknowledges the positive impact climate policies can have on health, such as providing cleaner air and safer drinking water. The declaration is not legally binding, but health is now formally recognised as an important part of negotiations around climate change. Sunday also saw controversy over comments by the summit's own head, Sultan al Jaber, from the United Arab Emirates. It came during a testy exchange with the former Irish president, Mary Robinson, at an online forum in the run-up to the summit. She demanded that Abu Dhabi led the way on ending fossil fuel extraction. This is Mr al Jaber's response. You're asking for a phase out of fossil fuel. Please help me. Show me a roadmap for a phase out of fossil fuel that will allow for sustainable socio-economic development, unless you want to take the world back into caves. The Sheikh, who's also chief executive of Abu Dhabi's national oil company, insisted he was committed to ending the world's reliance on fossil fuels, but only if it's done in a sustainable way. I respect the science, and there is no science out there or no scenario that says that the phase out of fossil fuel is what's going to achieve 1.5 is my north star a phase down and a phase out of fossil fuel in my view is inevitable it is essential but we need to be real serious and pragmatic about it the bbc's former science editor david shukman is at the summit in his current role as an independent climate consultant he was on the fringe of the main event when news broke of sultan al jaba's comments it was an extraordinary moment i was at a briefing by some very respected polar scientists we're explaining the latest impact of warming on the ice sheets and what it means for life in the oceans and above all for the rise of sea level which is incredibly important for coastal cities and while they were doing this someone noticed on their phone the breaking news that sultan al jaba had said as you say there was no science requiring fossil fuels to be phased out well we have known for 150 years there's been an accumulation of science over that time showing that more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere will trap more heat raise temperatures melt even more ice drive up sea level so scientists are absolutely appalled at this even before this drop 400 of them had signed a letter demanding the phase out of fossil fuels as soon as possible and i think what we're just reading right now will reinforce that Climate consultant David Schuchman. And staying with COP28, Mia Motley, the Prime Minister of Barbados, has emerged as the champion of the smaller island nations vulnerable to the impact of climate change from tropical storms and rising sea levels. One of their biggest challenges is to finance infrastructure to protect against the impact of climate change and to get insurance against the damage. Our climate editor, Justin Rolat, caught up with Mia Motley at the conference. In our regions, we are closely becoming uninsurable with the fact that insurance manages risk, low risk, medium risk, but the climate crisis is almost certainty. So where does that leave us? And we've seen the evidence of it with the withdrawal of insurance companies in California under right in fire. We've seen companies in Florida start to retreat. So therefore, you need to be able to restructure the entire financial system to ensure that there's far more access to longer term capital at cheaper rates if we're going to not have to choose between people and planet. Why would that be so transformative? Let's take your country, UK. When you had to fight World War I, you borrowed money in 1914 and 1917. You soon realized by 1932 that you couldn't repay the debt that you borrowed for fighting the war while borrowing for reconstruction. And you changed it into a perpetual debt that you never paid off until 2014. If that was appropriate for a leading industrial country in the 20th century, which you were, can you imagine how much more necessary it is for countries that are developing and don't have access to money that is longer than 15 or 20 years. The markets and the development banks need to be able to be looking at 30 and 40 year money so that we can have the time to have the growth that we need when we invest in education, that we need when we invest in healthcare. Have the space to do all of that while investing in coastal infrastructure. We can't do it with short term money. Development and human growth is long term. But the money on the table here is pathetic at the moment, isn't it? It's not enough. It's very diplomatic. (laughs) It's a start, but we need to have 
larger amounts if oil and gas companies, which earned $4 trillion in profits last year, give 5%, which is $200 billion. That's significantly more than anything that's in a loss and damage fund today. If we agree that every person who travels domestically or internationally says, look, I want to play my part in saving the planet. I'll put $5 in domestic travel. I'll put $10 in international travel. And if you're traveling first class, put $100. We have $7 trillion in value of global goods and shipping across the world. But yet we don't have a mechanism for extracting value. If you put 1% on every container, that's $70 billion. We haven't touched the finance companies yet and the banks who need to be touched because they provide the oxygen for all of this. And we haven't touched equally the insurance companies. But here's the deal. All of it can go into loss and damage because loss and damage is after the damage. We need much more in adaptation, which is why we're working with the World Bank and the IMF to restructure and to stretch their balance sheet. But we also have to confront the geopolitics of the shareholding and to determine whether that is not a constraining factor in the recapitalization of the bank. The Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, speaking there to Justin Rolat. A leading campaigner for democracy in Hong Kong has fled to Canada and says she will not return to Hong Kong. Agnes Chow says that way she'll be free from the threat of detention. Our Asia Pacific Regional Editor, Mickey Bristow, has the details. Despite her youth, Agnes Chow is a veteran democracy campaigner. She spent six months in jail for taking part in protests against the Chinese government in Hong Kong in 2019. She'd also been accused, although not charged, of colluding with foreign forces and was on police bail. Despite that, the authorities in Hong Kong had allowed her to travel to Toronto in Canada in September to study. She's now announced on her 27th birthday that she won't be returning to Hong Kong, perhaps ever. Since China tightened its control over Hong Kong, most democracy activists have fled, are in prison or remain silent. In a social media post, she said the decision to stay in Canada had not been taken easily, but she said she had to consider her physical and mental well-being. Mickey Bristow. Still to come on the Global News Podcast. Tabby McTat was a busker's cat. With a meow that was loud and strong. Meow. The two of them sang of this and that, and people threw coins in the old checked hat. A new animation based on a story by the creators of The Gruffalo and other much-loved children's books. Let's return now to our main story. After three days of intense bombardment, the Israeli military says its ground offensive against Hamas targets in southern Gaza is underway. The announcement came on the day an interfaith peace vigil for Israel and Gaza was held here in central London. Those gathered spoke out against both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia while mourning those killed in the conflict. Organisers say it was the biggest mass vigil of its kind in the UK. The BBC's Megan Owen spoke to Palestinian peace activist Hamza Awad and Israeli peace activist Magan Inon, who both have family members killed in the war. Many people showed up and people were hungry to hear such visions and such uh, stands in these hard times because people don't know how to deal with this conflict, how to not uh, choose the side of hate and still be involved. And we showed them that it's good that we are paying attention to this conflict, but they should never let hate come to the way because no amount of hate will assure any father or any family back home, both in Israel and Palestine. And if they can come together, then this gives hope to people that one day there will be peace there. And you've both got very personal reasons for being here. You both had family members killed in the conflict. Again, what drives you to be here today? You know, Hamza has a son who is uh, six. And my son is uh, almost seven. What drives me is that I want day to grow up not hating anyone, not fearing anyone, and be able to play together like human beings and enjoy each other's company. And that's what drives us. And for that to happen, we have to make the bridge today. So they will have a better future. We love our kids and that's the world we want them to grow up in. Hamza, you flew to the UK especially for this vigil. What was so different about this for you? In these dark times, it's so easy to lose hope because you see the amount of hatred, you see the amount of bloodshed. When I heard about this happening, I knew this is where I belong because if anything would help my people, 
And the Israeli people that I know very well and I'm close to is people coming for peace, for the future of humanity in Israel and Palestine and all over the world, because humanity is one. Here I know I'm not harming anyone. Any other stance will not help my people, will not help the other people, and I'm not going to waste my energy there. I think one of the things that was most striking about today's vigil was the lack of placards. Megan, why were you encouraging people not to bring them today? So, talking about our kids again, it, you don't educate a child to have the core values you want, you know, respecting uh, other human beings, other people from other faiths and backgrounds. You don't educate a child by a placard or a slogan. It, it takes time and effort. You have to move step by step. You have to get the support of your community. And I think in the same way, if we want to achieve peace, you know, any kind of a clever slogan is not going to do it. We need to work hard day in, day out, put time and effort. If we want to have a solution, we want to have peace step by step. I hope it's going to come sooner than later, but it's going to come. It's inevitable. It's a powerful image seeing both of you stood beside each other. What message does this send to the world? That it's possible. It's not easy, but it's our duty, as he said, for our children. My family grew up in conflict, I grew up in conflict, and I see now my son is going even to a way worse conflict than we ever knew in the past. If we don't remind ourselves and people of our humanity, then which word we are giving to our children? We are betraying them, actually. I'm not sure that his, his future will be better, but he will know that his father have done something hoping for a better future. Megan, what's the feeling after today's vigil for you? Is it hope? I think I feel supported. It's knowing that you're not alone. And I think coming here together and hearing different voices, a large community getting together, hoping for a better future and doing it together, it just uh, gives us support and, and hope that we can do it. And I completely agree with Hamza. The point is that to show that it's possible and it is possible. Palestinian peace activist Hamza Awad and Israeli peace activist Megan Enon speaking there to Megan Owen. A respected Swedish think tank says total revenues for the world's biggest arms companies actually fell by 3.5% last year, despite Russia launching its full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, SIPRI, said this was largely due to backlogs in fulfilling earlier orders and difficulties some major manufacturers faced in ramping up production. Danny Eberhard reports. Cipri said the world's biggest hundred arms companies sold nearly $600 billion worth of weapons and military services last year. It could have been more, with global tensions fueling a surge in orders. But Covid-related issues such as labour shortages and disruption to supply chains meant some manufacturers struggled to respond fast. Some expect their revenues to rise significantly in the years ahead. Not all companies faced such a lag. The Turkish producer of a type of drone used heavily by Ukraine in the early stages of the war saw revenue soar, as did an Israeli company that manufactures anti-tank missile launchers. Overall, half of the revenues were brought in by US companies. All the top five biggest manufacturers are American. Companies in China, the next most significant nation, accounted for 18%. Cipri named China, along with India and Turkey, as being among the countries that are pushing hard to be self-reliant in arms production. For a second consecutive year, the combined revenues of arms companies in Asia and Oceania outstripped those of Europe. The Institute did acknowledge difficulties in getting a full picture of the situation in Russia, bemoaning what it called diminishing transparency in the industry there. Danny Eberhard. Next to Ghana, where the fishing industry is under threat. The sector employs more than 200,000 people and provides a living to millions more. But rising sea levels have destroyed dozens of coastal fishing communities. With hundreds more still at risk, Natalia Zwa went to meet a group of female climate pioneers who are helping to support struggling businesses. Stretching along the Gulf of Guinea coast and out into the mouth of the Volta River is a narrow sandbank. Behind it, a lagoon and hundreds of kilometres of wetlands. It's lined with the abandoned shells of wooden buildings. This is all that remains of Fuvame village. Moses Akoli was the village's chief fisherman. He takes us out into the gulf. Not all the destruction is visible. He shows us where his home once stood. We are now in the middle of the sea. 
here is the place where we stay before the tea are taking the land away. It's been four years since extreme weather caused the tidal waves which claimed Fuvame. The residents were forced to relocate. Many found themselves here in the neighboring community of Akokaji. In this fishing reliant community, labor is divided. As the men patrol the Gulf, Agokaji's female residents prepare the fish for market. This is what we are used to. If we move, we don't know what we're going to do for a living. Susanuk Tosueto is married to Moses. She moved here with him. When the tidal waves flooded our homes, we watched helplessly. We don't have money to build a concrete house. We're in God's hands. Damage to property isn't the only concern. Fish stocks along Ghana's coast have been significantly reduced in recent years, in part linked to the warming of the coast's shallow waters. At a gathering of fishmongers, they sing, The fish are hiding. The seas is taking our land. We want the situation tackled urgently. The women fishmongers of Agokaji have banded together to support each other and their families. Essie Bobasa, the chief fishmonger, has set up a cooperative association of local fishmongers designed to help out should another disaster strike. The way the support work is that we lend money to the sisters in need. For example, if someone's house is destroyed, we can support the person. The association has grown to almost 100 members, but Essie still fears a tidal event of the same scale which took Fuvame. Essie Bobasa ending that report by Natalia Zwa. Now, any proud gardener knows there's an endless variety of choice when it comes to ornaments to decorate their cherished plot. Most people wouldn't include, though, an unexploded bomb alongside any garden gnomes, water features and pots. But unbeknownst to them, that's exactly what a couple from Milford Haven in Wales had been doing. Sean and Geoffrey Edwards say the device, which weighed nearly 30 kilos, had been outside their home all their lives. The BBC's David Grundy explains. This all started on Wednesday evening. Sean and Geoffrey Edwards were at home in Milford Haven in Pembrokeshire in South West Wales. A police officer who was walking past just happened to spot this thing in their garden and decided he didn't really like the look of it. So he knocked on their door and told them he'd have to alert the Ministry of Defence. An hour later, they were told the bomb squad would be there in the morning to get rid of it. Now, I spoke to Geoffrey and Sean on the phone earlier. He told me he's quite a character. He told me he didn't have time for me to go and see him today because they're far too busy putting up their Christmas decorations. We did have a bit of a chat, though, and what he told me was that Wednesday night was a pretty sleepless night because they were told the whole street might have to be evacuated. Now, the bomb disposal unit from Ashchurch in Gloucestershire, which is about 160 miles and three hours away by road, they arrived the next morning. They did test on what the couple had thought was a dummy and what they found was that it was an actually a live bomb which had a tiny amount of charge. Jeffrey told me that he told the bomb disposal unit, we're not leaving the house, we're staying here. If it goes up, 